this is why our voice sounds more high, punchy, or annoying on recordings. In painting, tone is used to describe the shades of colours used. And much like in painting, our vocal tone is the shades and colours in our voice. And these colours can be used to express so much the meaning in between the words, the emotions, our unspoken intentions and our personalities. Some say you can even tell a person's health just from the tone of their voice. We are with our voice every single day. So why do so many of us dislike our own voice? To understand this, first we need to look at how the voice works. Sound is vibrations, or more accurately, how your brain perceives these vibrations. We create our vocal vibrations at the vocal cords in our larynx and these vibrations travel up the vocal tract out of our mouth and into the air. The frequency, or how quickly these vibrations move, define the pitch of the noise you make. So the faster your vocal cords vibrate, the higher sound you get. But there is a little more to it than that. When we hear a note, we aren't just hearing one note, but a series of frequencies layered on top of each other. Now, that bottom frequency, we call that the fundamental frequency, and that's what your brain perceives as the pitch. The layers on top of that, those are the harmonics, and those define the tone. So here you can see my voice on a spectrogram and you can see all the different frequencies happening. So I'm just going to give you a note so you can really see what's going on. Uh... So the bottom line is the note that you hear, the fundamental frequency and uh... all those lines above are the harmonics. We all have our own unique tone, and this is because everyone's body is different. Our vocal tone is defined by the shape and size of our vocal cords and our vocal tract. And much like different types of paint can be equally wonderful, every unique tone, if used in the right way, can be equally beautiful. But, as I said earlier, sound isn't just vibrations, it's how our brain perceives these vibrations. And before the brain can process this sound, it has to go through several filters. When we make a sound, the vibrations exit our mouth, travel through the air, and enter our ear canals. It makes sense, right? That's how sound works. Well, it's not the whole story. Your vocal tract is made up of muscle and tissue and bone, and all of these things can conduct sound. Some of the sound does not make it out of the vocal tract, it does not escape your body, and instead travels to your inner ear via bone and tissue conduction. Here is where something really interesting happens. Filter number one. When sounds travel through tissue and through bone, they boost, although not always, the lower harmonics, the lower frequencies within the sound. So this is the part, the harmonics that make your sound feel warmer and richer and perceived as lower. That's why so many of us think our voice sounds high and punchy and annoying on recordings. <laughs> Want to know how your voice sounds just via bone conduction? Well, cover your ears, speak out loud. This is bone and tissue conduction in action. When we speak without covering our ears, we hear the sound that travels out of our mouth and travels through the air and enters our ears this way. And we also hear the sound from inside that goes to our ears via bone and tissue conduction simultaneously at the same time. 
This is why our voice sounds so different on recordings. It's not recording what you're actually hearing. If we can learn to embrace and kindly critique our voice on recordings, then it can be such a steep learning curve. I actually ask a lot of my singing pupils to record their practices and listen back to their practice because then they can get a more accurate view of the sounds that they are producing. But there are some more filters going on. Number two, this is a protective reflex that triggers when you hear a really loud noise and it also triggers when you hear the sound of your own voice, whether it's in singing or speaking. This reflex contracts muscles and makes the tiny little bones between your cochlea and your eardrum become rigid. This stops as much sound being transmitted, it dampens the sound and you don't hear your voice as loudly as it actually is. The next filter happens at the cochlea, the part of our ear that processes sound and it's made up of living cells. Now these living cells trigger differently to different stimuli and one of the things that it does is filter out the sounds that we hear the most often. This is so we don't spend time and energy processing sounds that we don't need to listen to. You might know this effect if you live under a flight path, but as our voice is one of the sounds we hear the most often, our cochlea filters some of the sound out. So, your brain is distorted by bone conduction, dampened by a reflex, and filtered out by the cochlea. It is no surprise that our voice doesn't sound like what we expect on recordings, but there is one more filter going on, and this happens at the brain. Neurologists found out that when we create a sound, our auditory cortex partially shuts down, selectively silencing and amplifying the sounds that are important for us to hear. This allows us to differentiate one voice from another and listen out for danger whilst preventing sensory overload from the sound of our own voice. In short, although we are aware that we're speaking, we don't necessarily listen to the tone of our voice. In fact, we recognize our voice so little that in a 1967 study, only 38% of people could identify their voice within five seconds. After all these barriers to hearing our voice physiologically, there's also a psychological element to consider our inner voice. We have a constant dialogue going on. It is the voice of our thoughts. This is the voice that we hear when we're rehearsing that important conversation with our boss, or when we're reading an article, or when you're telling yourself off for being late for an appointment. Scientists theorize that this is our brain trying to copy the sound of our own voice. But this voice can also be distorted. It's filtered through our sense of self, our culture, gender, and everything that we think we are or want to be. Some people can manipulate the tone of this voice, and some people have a very clear and fixed tone for this voice. And for others, it is the clearest voice that they hear. The more distorted our image of ourself is, the more distorted our image of our voice is. Remember that study where people find it really difficult to identify their voice? Well, it's interesting to note that people with body dysmorphia find it even harder to identify their voice. So we've learned that there are many things that can distort our vocal image of our voice. We build our vocal image on a distortion rather than on reality. But can recordings even accurately portray our voice? Can other people hear our voice accurately? And can we change the tone of our voice? I'll talk about this in future videos. Our recorded voice may be a little bit different than we expected, but in embracing and working with our tone's uniqueness, I truly believe that anyone can learn to master their speaking and singing voice. 
And in my experience, the uniqueness of our voice has an eerie way of echoing the uniqueness of our personalities. You cannot paint an oil painting with watercolours, but with a little know-how and creativity, you can create a masterpiece in any medium. Maybe we need to worry less about the paints that we have to use, and more about finding the colours to express ourselves. Hey, so this video was a little bit different. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you found it interesting. If you would like me to cover any more science-y topics, let me know. I'd love your ideas down in the comments and see you in the next one. Bye. Bye.